I'm here in New York State visiting Niagara Falls, and right across the river is Canada. Isn't that an awesome sight? Do you realize the energy that water possesses? Draining four of the Great Lakes, the Niagara River reaches the crest of the falls, traveling more than 40 miles per hour. Then it falls 176 feet over the American and Bridal Veil Falls, and 167 feet over the Canadian or Horseshoe Falls, more than half the length of a football field. But do you know the force of that water actually changes the shape of the falls? This is the birthplace of Niagara Falls at this cliff known as the Niagara Escarpment, which started a little over 12,000 years ago. And since that time, the falls has carved out the Niagara Gorge, and it's moved back over seven miles to its present location. The falls migrate upstream because of the differential strength of the rocks that underlie the region. At the top of the falls is an erosion-resistant rock called dolomite, or dolostone. Water going over the falls is able to undercut the softer shale and sandstone layers below, creating the potential for collapse. Tiny fractures in the dolostone, called joints, allow water to seep in. When the water freezes, it expands. The dolostone cracks, and these rocks break away and wash down into the plunge pool below, moving the falls back another notch. The amount of erosion at the falls has lessened over the thousands of years. Uh, originally, it was three to six feet a year, and its history eroding back to its present location. Uh, today, it's less than a foot a year. One of the main reasons for that is the 1950 treaty between the U.S. and Canada, which allows both countries to divert water above the falls for the production of electricity. To study the rate of erosion, the American falls were actually stopped in 1969. A coffer, or earthen dam, was built to reduce the falls to a trickle. Rocks were reinforced, but in the end, it was decided to let nature take its course. Since we seem to have committed lately to letting the falls uh, evolve naturally, uh, what's probably going to happen with time is that uh, the falls are going to continue to erode back upstream. Eventually, they'll join each other, and for a while, we might have one single incredibly large fall uh, going across the entire river, and we might even see someday 10, 20,000 years down the road, a waterfall coming directly out of Lake Erie. I got a souvenir for the bait shop. Wait till the gang sees this. Um, gee, Greg, it's, it's really nice. Hey, it could have been worse. Yeah, he could have brought us back some earthworms and dirt. Well, actually, all total, this is about how much rock on average Niagara Falls loses each year, one cubic meter. Wow. But I don't think you want to stop the falls to prevent the erosion. Nah, uh, and where will we get such groovy souvenirs? In fact, it's important to know that erosion is a natural process. It helped shape Niagara Falls and is continuing to shape the Earth's surface today. Think about all the forms of erosion. First, the Niagara Falls. That's the river kind. And here come waves, also water-driven. Then. There's what cools me off and wears things down, the wind. Speaking of cold, there's one more natural erosive force we're forgetting. I've got it, ice. You don't have to dig deep to see how each of the forces of erosion shapes the environment, even the ground that we walk on. Hi, my name is Bob McLeese. I'm the state soil scientist here in Champaign, Illinois. Here in Illinois, our soils were formed in windblown silt or lust blown up from the major river valleys during the last glacial period. In other parts of the country, you have parent material of uh, weathered bedrock. You also have soils that were formed in deposits laid down by flooding by rivers. We have microorganisms and macroorganisms that uh, work on that parent material that help form the soil and make the soil what it is. Soil erosion is a problem on our, all of our soils, whether in Illinois or elsewhere. Of course, that can be due to water or it could be due to wind. In Illinois, we have more of a problem with water erosion. Here in Illinois, the rate of soil loss is about four tons per acre per year on our cropland. Over a period of time, that's a lot of topsoil that's leaving our crop fields. Even though soil development is still taking place, it takes a long time to form an inch of soil much longer than any of our lifetimes. So if we lose an inch of topsoil due to erosion or some other calamity, that will not be replaced for many generations. So it becomes very important that we preserve and protect what we have. 
Scientists say it can take up to 500 years to create just one inch of new topsoil. Holy mackerel! If you look at the Mississippi River, you can really see why it's called Big Muddy. The Mississippi River is, is viewed as kind of muddy, essentially because it carries a, lot of, a large amount of sediment. Its basin drains 41% of the continental United States, drains all or portions of 31 states and two Canadian provinces. The sediment comes from topsoil that runs off of farms in the uh, various areas of the basin. It also comes from the channel itself. The river is continually scouring or eroding its channels on one side or the other, sometimes in the bottom. And the Corps of Engineers is, is very involved with maintaining the channel. At the mouth of the Mississippi River, where it enters the Gulf, we'll do a lot of maintenance dredging uh, during the course of the year, uh, primarily to keep the navigation channels open. Both the ocean currents in the Gulf and the sediment that's deposited from the river will tend to clog those channels. Another thing we do on the Mississippi River to maintain the channel is we'll place rock dikes out into the river. What this does is it tends to concentrate the flow of the river into the center of the channel. This helps the channel use its own force to maintain uh, the river without dredging. It'll push the sediments further downstream. There are numerous types of erosion that occur from nature. Certainly the largest amount of erosion is, is caused by water. The runoff over the farms, over the uh, forests and other communities, and even the channel erosion that occurs is all done by water. The end result certainly with the Mississippi is that every year we have millions of tons of sediment that's emptied into the Gulf of Mexico just from the Mississippi itself. In this century, thousands of people are building along the coast where ocean waves, storm surge, and winds are constantly eroding the shoreline. All along the coast, people have built on barrier islands that are forming, shifting, and reforming. Wave erosion has constantly shifted the shapes of these islands. These areas are occasionally threatened when erosion starts to wash away the sand under the building foundations, or wind in a hurricane threatens to blow away part of the island as a whole. Millions of dollars are spent each year trying to prevent beach erosion. Hurricane walls, rock jetties, and underwater artificial reefs are all meant to slow erosion. Some might call living on a barrier island an act of denial. In 2001, the city of Fort Pierce, Florida had to close a public beach because wave action had so eroded the shore that it posed a safety hazard. You can see where the shoreline was chopped away and this place by the sea almost became a place in the sea after the same waves worked on the ground below. Remember the incredible moving lighthouse at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina? This historic lighthouse had to be moved a half mile inland in 2000 because wave erosion of the point where it stood eventually washed away 1,500 feet of shoreline. Here's the way it looked hanging out in the ocean. And here it is today. Despite record level El Nino storm waves in 1999, Washington State's wash away beach is no longer washing away. In 1998, an underwater dike and groin was added to divert the incoming waves. Erosion along the six mile beach that used to average 150 feet per year has been reduced to zero. And the wave action that used to cut away at the coastline is now actually helping to accumulate sand deposits. Pumped in sand or beach nourishment is also being used to combat erosion. Wind and water are just as powerful in smaller amounts. For example, the desert. The desert is an environment chock full of sandstone, a soft rock that needs only a little weathering to start crumbling. This often happens along the exposed face of rock cliffs. Canyon de Chez in Arizona shows how early Native Americans took advantage of such breakdowns to build homes in the caves created. These dwellings sit on an absolute vertical drop, weathered over the years and advantageous for warding off animals and enemies. Some wonders of rock out west are just wind erosion. Strong winds pick up loose sediment and like a sandblaster, carve through the soft sandstone landscape, creating formations like buttes, arches, and hoodoos. Raindrops can cause what is known as splash erosion simply by their impact. Add that splashing motion on the hill, and splash erosion will move soil down slope. Grass can slow down erosion simply by getting in the way. But grass may not be enough to prevent hillside erosion. 
How about those expensive homes in California that are constantly in danger of landslides from saturated soils? In Natchez, Mississippi, homes that were built on the bluffs along the Mississippi River more than 100 years ago are now just barely hanging on. Have you ever wondered why an area would be called the Badlands? In early America, the word was coined for land that would bear no crops, not even grass for grazing cattle. A great example of what we mean are the Badlands along the White River in South Dakota. The reason this occurs is because in most of the planet's environments, under the usual topsoil that washes away, most areas have rock, but in the Badlands, the next layer is clay which is also easily eroded by rainwater runoff. The area erodes so fast, you don't see plants because they don't have time to take root before the next erosion event occurs. But did you ever imagine that this scene, bursting with living plants, might also be an invitation for erosion? Humans are also a major erosive force, and farming has been eroding the environment for thousands of years. In the 1800s, Farmers cleared so many trees in this area of Georgia that the topsoil lost a root system to cling to and wore away. What started out as ditches have eroded into gullies 150 feet deep and a quarter mile wide as water cut through the soft sandstone beneath. What remains has become Providence Canyon State Park, Georgia's little Grand Canyon. Across the Great Plains, years of overplowing combined with an extended drought brought about major dust storms during the 1930s. Winds, known as black blizzards, carried millions of tons of topsoil across the region, blocking out sunlight, choking cattle, and driving 60% of the population away. The Dust Bowl, as the area became known, prompted the federal government to create the Soil Conservation Service to promote better farming practices. Take an acre of farmed or cultivated land. Compare it to an acre of pasture land. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says that in one year's time, the cultivated land will lose 22 tons of valuable topsoil per acre, while the same amount of land anchored by pasture vegetation loses only one and a half tons per acre. But some farmers are cutting down on erosion while still getting the same crop yield. Traditionally, we've looked at a field uh, uh, and thought that we had to till the entire field, loosen it so that we could plant the crop that we were interested in. But with this piece of apparatus, we don't have to till the whole field. We can till a very narrow strip. If we can maintain a cover on the soil, that's going to protect the soil and hold it in place. So the more tillage we do, so far as erosion is concerned, the worse it is because the more the ground's exposed. This is a field that's been tilled in a conventional fashion. You can see there's uh, not much residue left on the soil surface, so there's not much to prevent erosion. If the wind sweeps through here, it can get a hold of the soil particles and blow them to the next county. Or if we have a hard rain, the rain can carry the soil down the slope. This field is a field that is what we would call minimum till because we have not gone over it a number of times with uh, tillage machinery. This is wheat residue from the wheat harvest earlier this year. It's critically important in controlling erosion. It breaks the impact of raindrops, and raindrops can have tremendous energy. This also protects from wind erosion because the residue covers the soil and holds the soil in place. And that is critical because if we don't hold the soil in place, it will end up in our streams and eventually end up in the reservoirs. And then down the road, you won't have a place to swim, much less water to drink. Here's a tackle box brain teaser for you. Approximately what percent of land on the earth do we depend upon to produce the world's food supply? A, 10%, B, 25%, C, 50%, or D, 75%. What does a farmer's topsoil mean to me? Well, hamburgers, for instance. From the grain the bread is made from, to the lettuce, tomato, mustard, ketchup, and of course the burger. Hold the pickle. Topsoil erosion affects the price of cotton and linen. If it's difficult to grow, you could suffer sticker shock at the store. If a farmer's pesticides and topsoil drain into your lake or river, you could lose your local swimming hole. 
The added sediment will block sunlight the plants need for photosynthesis, while the fertilizer can cause excessive growth and decay, reducing oxygen and killing fish. You don't have to look far to find what lack of living plants does to the soil. You can see similar conditions in some urban construction sites, like this one. In phase one, builders cut down virtually all trees to make building easier. Backhoes smooth and shape the ground. And with all that moving soil, plant life is wiped clean. Then after the structure goes up, phase two, a landscaping team comes into plant. These plants will help reduce erosion once they take root just in time for the building project to reach completion. But in the meantime, if you look along the edges of a work site, you often see erosion like this after a simple rainstorm. On hillsides, scientists call this a rill. And when rills join together, they form a gully. Contractors use best management practices, or BMPs, to reduce soil loss. Silt fences keep loose topsoil from traveling to nearby streams. Swales allow for drainage without soil erosion and retention ponds can be used to contain runoff. And the answer to the tackle box brain teaser is A. Once you take into account terrain that is too hot, cold, high, rocky, or wet to support crops, you're left with just 10% of the Earth's land to grow food on. And let's not forget that ice is a big erosion force. Think about glaciers grinding down a mountainside. They're kind of like bulldozers made of ice. Though glaciers move very slowly, they're very powerful. And because their underside is usually wet, sand and dirt seem to jump at the chance to get stuck on a glacier as it moves. The action works just like sandpaper on the land in the glacier's path. Trees are knocked over, boulders are moved, valleys are reshaped, and sometimes a lake forms where water has been trapped behind the material deposited by the glacier. I never realized all the forces at work to create a home for these little guys. Yeah, forces like water, wind, and ice that erode the soil. Then there's all the human forces at work trying to prevent erosion from happening. But really, erosion's not all bad. Some of the most beautiful places on Earth were shaped by erosion. Speaking of beautiful places, what about a bait shop souvenir? Maybe a worm dome? Greg, I think it's time for another vacation. Maybe it's not just Niagara Falls that's losing it. Is it possible for an IQ to erode? Maybe we could just do a postcard. <laughs> you don't have to look far to find what lack of living plants does to the soil. We're supposed right to stop here. that one. Right here. Right there. Awesome. No, no, no. We're going to try that again. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta figure out the right, the right, nah. <laughs> Gee, Greg, it's nice. <laughs> I can't be sarcastic. I can't be sarcastic. I really like it. <laughs> We're gonna have to have a talk with our writer because <laughs> 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 To learn more, visit the Tackle Box website.